Of all of the elements that have fascinated the human race, this, gold, has been the centre of attention for much of our civilised history. It's both surprisingly common and simultaneously very rare to find, durable yet malleable. It resists corrosion and is highly conductive and probably most importantly, it's shiny. But the most surprising thing about it is that data collected over the last few years proves that we still can't explain where it actually comes from. The precious metal soaring to a new record high today. The record high. The record high again. Multiple record highs this year. He who has the gold makes the rule. He who has the gold makes the rule. Across many ancient cultures, gold, the sun, and divine creation were inseparable concepts. The ancient Egyptians believed that gold was an indestructible metal derived from the flesh of the gods, particularly Ra, the sun god. The Incan civilization believed gold came from the sweat of their sun god, Inti. In Greek mythology, the legend of King Midas, who could turn anything he touched into gold, fascinated and concerned us. The mastery of this element symbolized both the creation of limitless wealth and the potential for corruption and destruction. This didn't stop a multi-century long pursuit though, from ancient Greek to 19th century alchemists to even Isaac Newton himself, to find the origin of the Philosopher's Stone, a legendary substance believed to have the ability to transform base metals like lead into gold or silver, and even the power to grant immortality through the elixir of life. History isn't without a sense of irony. After almost a millennia long pursuit of trying to find gold, interest in transmission mutation ebbed and faded. Just a hundred years later though, we finally worked out how to do it. In 1970, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California, nuclear chemists, which is a funny way of saying physicists, Glenn Seaborg and Walt Loveland used a linear particle accelerator to bombard bismuth nuclei with very high energy carbon and neon atoms to knock protons and neutrons off of the bismuth nuclei. For the first time in history, successfully transmuting an element into gold. Before we get excited here, the amount of gold produced was minuscule, barely more than a few atoms. The process of nuclear transmutation into gold, it turns out, was just highly inefficient and also expensive. Seaborg estimated that it would cost one quadrillion dollars to make one ounce of gold through this method, more money than has ever existed. At that time, an ounce of gold was worth about $560, meaning this would be a negative 99.9999999944 return on investment. Gold Gold remains both incredibly difficult to produce, but also strangely abundant. The Earth's crust alone contains 1.6 parts per million of gold. Given that Earth's crust has a mass of about 2.2 times 10 to the 19 metric tons, this implies that there are about 35 million metric tons of gold in the Earth's crust alone. As a species, we've extracted around 200,000 metric tons of gold, roughly equivalent to just over four Olympic-sized swimming pools full of gold, which would be worth around $11.6 trillion. So if it's so hard to produce, why do we have so much of it? And where does it all come from? Well, it turns out that our ancestors' association with gold and the sun was actually a really good starting point, the roaring inferno at the center of a star. When you start a new universe, your initial resources are limited. After a big bang and a period of cooling, protons, neutrons and electrons start to aggregate to form our universe's simplest and lightest elements, hydrogen and helium, and sometimes a trace amount of lithium and beryllium. To start to produce more interesting elements, you need to wait for the force of gravity to bring together clouds of these gases and begin to tightly squeeze them. If the mass of these clouds is large enough and so capable of producing sufficient inward gravitational force and pressure, the elements at the center of this ball of gas are forced closer and closer together, and their temperatures begin to raise, until the lightest of these elements, hydrogen nuclei, are bouncing back and forth against their neighboring hydrogen nuclei with such speed that they overcome the electrostatic force that keeps like charges apart and get so close that the strong force snaps them together to form helium. This turns the hot cloud of gas into a star. 
This process, fusion, specifically a type of fusion called hydrogen burning, produces sufficient energy and heat to resist the inward crushing force of further gravitational collapse of the star. But this only lasts while the star has sufficient hydrogen to power it. Now this may be several hundreds of millions of years, but once the hydrogen supply is exhausted, with no fusion to provide an outward force, the internal pressure reduces and the star again begins to collapse until it compresses so tightly it ignites the next fusion process, helium burning, converting the helium supply into carbon and heavier nuclei. This cycle continues from helium to carbon burning to oxygen to silicon and finally to iron. But then once a significant amount of iron has built up in the core, the process stops as it is not energetically favorable to fuse iron nuclei together. But at this point in time, through this process called stellar nucleosynthesis, we have only produced half of our periodic table, so that can't be the end of our story. As the fusion fuel runs out in the core of a star, the star no longer has a way to counterbalance gravity, and it collapses in a fraction of a second. This core collapse triggers a shock wave that propagates outward. That event is so violent that the outer layers rebound off of the core in a massive explosion, a type 2 supernova. From this explosion, one of the most violent events in the universe, we get two things. Number one, we get some further nucleosynthesis of heavier elements than iron, nickel, cobalt, copper, zinc, even some gold, platinum, and uranium. But when we look closely at these events, even though the pressure and temperatures are immense during a supernova, these conditions only last for a very short time before the matter is flung apart across the universe, and ultimately, these are very low efficiency processes, meaning they don't produce enough material to explain the the level of abundance of gold in our universe. It turns out that depending on the mass of the star before the supernova, we are also left with item 2, either a black hole or more useful in our Midas-like pursuit, a neutron star, an object with approximately 1.4 to 2 times the mass of our sun, compressed into an object with a radii of about 10 to 15 kilometers. This gives them incredibly high densities, around 10 to the 18 kilograms per cubic meter, meaning a sugar cube sized amount of neutron star material would have a mass of about a billion tons. That's roughly equivalent to the weight of K2, the second highest mountain in the world. But how does that get us to our goal of producing gold? Now here, I think it would be totally reasonable if you're expecting me to say, similar to star formation creating heavier elements in their core, in this new ultra-dense neutron star, the increased density should enable good further element formation but it turns out that isn't what happens. What we must wait for is two of these neutron stars to be in approximately the same place at the same time and form a binary star system, where the neutron stars orbit trapped in each other's gravitational pull for millions to hundreds of millions of years, orbiting so violently they send ripples in space-time out across the universe, until ultimately they collide. A neutron star merger event, usually called a killer nova, and the cataclysmic energy that they release facilitates rapid neutron capture of nearby elements. It was these merger events that scientists believe was leading to the creation of heavier elements such as gold, platinum, and other rare earth elements. These materials then enrich the surrounding interstellar medium as they are scattered out across the universe. These scattering events glow in their aftermath of the event through radioactive decay and thermal heating. And in addition to the gravitational waves, it is this thermal signature that we can detect on Earth. Our conviction that these relatively rare killer nova events accounted for somewhere between 80 to 100% of gold formation in our universe felt theoretically sound, but it wasn't until 2017 that we had the opportunity to see one in action. On August 17th, 2017, the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave detectors picked up signal GW170817, followed almost immediately by a short period gamma ray burst, the AT2017 GFO killer nova event. As the two neutron stars collided, they emitted a massive cloud of heavy elements. By fitting the observed light curves and spectra from these events, scientists estimated that the total mass of the ejector was found to be around 5-10% to of the mass of our sun. 
Estimation of the gold mass based on the total ejector mass and the predicted fractions of heavy elements produced a gold mass of around 10 times the mass of the Earth. At the time, this event appeared to solve the mystery. It seemed that the vast majority of gold, as well as other heavy elements, were primarily produced in neutron star merger events. There's a famous video from around the news release where a research team member says, The gold in this watch was very likely produced in the collision of two neutron stars. However, as there often is with physics, there was a catch. As we have continued to observe the universe over the past seven years since the 2017 event, discrepancies have begun to emerge. As of today, despite several years of additional observation time and detection of many other gravitational merger events, most of them black hole black hole mergers, only one other binary neutron star merger event has been observed, which, following this rarity, extrapolated out to the rest of the universe Universe would mean these events weren't common enough to explain gold's abundance. The other slightly damning piece of evidence here was that the one other neutron star merger event that we did observe did not produce any heavy elements. Just when we thought we had finally found gold's origin, it seems again that we were back to the drawing board. There are, of course, several possible solutions to explain the discrepancies in our observations. Maybe the frequency of the neutron star merger events is evolving, and it was more common in the past, explaining why the universe previously was so good at generating gold. Or perhaps it's that the most energetic type II supernova create more heavy elements than we previously calculated or observed. Or maybe, during the latter stages of a star's life, a slow neutron capture process allows elements to advance up up the periodic table to produce those heavier elements we see today. Regardless of the explanation, each of these theories has their own flaws that don't quite match current theory or current observations. It may be that the 2017 event was just incredibly rare and we were very lucky to see it. Or it might be the reverse, that we've been unusually unlucky in the last seven years not to see another one. The science of uncertainty here is difficult to understand which way we are biasing ourselves. What it leaves us with is another step in the story written by humanity over thousands of years to understand where this mystical, rare but abundant element actually comes from. At worst, maybe this is an explanation why the recent price of gold is skyrocketing. If you like this video, you might be interested in the breakthrough that led us to understand how the force that holds these neutrons and protons together to actually form gold inside an atom actually works. Check it out here. As always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next week. Goodbye.